Welcome to the second season of the WDC Distinguished Lecture Series. This season revolves around effective altruism, and the lectures are organized in coordination with the Effective Altruism Debating Championship. Today, our speaker is Ishan Gupta Sarma. Ishan is a curriculum developer and content writer at Charity Entrepreneurship. He joined the team after attending the Charity Entrepreneurship 2019 incubation program. He works with the curriculum team designing course content, as well as taking on diverse responsibilities, such as writing outreach material and coordinating conferences. Before joining Charity Entrepreneurship, Ishan undertook research in behavioral neuroscience and cognitive psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and later at the University of Chicago. He has also done volunteer projects, including science education in Delhi and research for Rethink Priorities. Ishan's talk is titled Charity Entrepreneurship. We're really excited to host Ishan, and for similar content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hey everyone, I'm so happy to be speaking with you all today. Um, I know that many of you are interested in making the world a better place, and I hope this lecture series helps showcase some new perspectives on how to do that. My name is Ishan Kaptasarma. I have been working at Charity Entrepreneurship for about a year now, and I'm here to explain what we do as an organization. So I'm going to start with this graph. It shows the fraction of the population that is living at various income levels. And as you can see, most people live under $10 a day, and some people live on even less than that. And this has real consequences globally. Um, as you can see, uh, countries that have a lower income have a higher child mortality, a lower life expectancy, and lower life satisfaction. Um, so we can really do better. Some of my colleagues earlier also spoke about factory farming, as well as extinction risks from emerging technologies. So how do we begin to actually tackle these issues? Uh, well, in the previous lectures, you might have heard a little bit about effective altruism. Uh, it is in part um, an open question about how to do the most good, in part a methodology of figuring out what the most cost-effective, best things to do are. Um, but it's also an ecosystem, a network of organizations that each in their own way try to contribute towards having the greatest impact possible. There's many different avenues to have an impact. Uh, some organizations focus on acquiring resources. So this can mean donations. Um, this can mean uh, recruiting talented people to work in organizations. Or it can mean advocacy, advocating for more development spending or policy, which is more favorable to uh, the goals of having an impact. Um, other organizations uh, try to figure out how to allocate resources. So this can mean scientific research, it can mean external evaluation of nonprofits and charities, um, it can mean rigorous cost-effectiveness analysis of which interventions work. And finally, some organizations focus on direct work. So in many ways, of course, this is one of the most challenging and most important um, elements of having an impact, is who's actually on the ground, who's actually working on the issues. What all of these organizations have in common is that they're all making choices about how to best have an impact. And this is where this discussion comes back to you. What choices are you going to make to uh, make a difference to the world? And I think the answer to that question often comes down to what do we need? Um, what are the things that we need to do to take care of our global family? Um, so I think it's possible to make uh, quite a long list of things. Uh, there's a lot of gaps in the world, there's a lot of things that need doing, and it'll be difficult to prioritize between these. What it ultimately comes down to is, what do you have the power to do? Which resources can you command, and how will you allocate these resources across these interventions? And this is where it can often become quite uncomfortable, because prioritizing where to allocate your resources means that some organizations will get funded while others won't, some interventions will be done while others won't, and some people will be helped while others won't. And this can be um, an incredibly difficult thing, especially when you're working in the front lines, but even just considering it hypothetically. Um, and I think the reason why this feels so terrible is that we shouldn't really have to choose, right? We could be, you know, as a society, we could be putting out more resources and helping everybody. However, the unfortunate truth is that as an individual, you only have control over a limited amount of resources. Um, and so you ultimately are making a choice about what to do with those resources. So let's talk about some choices that you as an individual could make. 
Uh, suppose you do nothing and uh, some government body or funder or um, foundation is giving a $10 million grant to Intervention A. And suppose you do some fundraising or some advocacy and uh, convince that funder to transfer $1 million to Intervention B. How will you figure out whether this is a po positive development? Um, so effective altruists have this term called the counterfactual. Uh, and the counterfactual is, uh, what does the world look like if you hadn't acted? And then what does the world look like if you had? And what is the difference between these two worlds? That difference is called the counterfactual. And our goal is to make that counterfactual impact, the, um, the results of our actions relative to have if we had not acted, to make it as positive as, and as beneficial as possible. Um, so how do we measure the impact of our action? Uh, well, it depends on what intervention A and intervention B are. So suppose intervention A was water sanitation and intervention B was vaccination. Um, you might not have enough information at the moment to know which of these needs to be more of a priority. Uh, let's introduce a simpler example, one which is a little easier to understand. Um, suppose intervention A was... Uh, to get a guide dog for the blind. So a guide dog is an animal which helps the blind navigate the world spatially, um, and it costs about $10,000 to train the dog. So after the dog is trained, it will be able to help guide a blind person to do things like cross the street or navigate um, you know, a crowded kind of uh, intersection. Um, and say intervention B is a cataract surgery. So um, that can cost about $35 to do. Um, and when somebody has a cataract surgery, um, they don't have as much visual impairment as they did before. Um, so in this case, um, if you avert $1 million from uh, training guide dogs towards cataract surgery, uh, you actually prevent um, 25,000 additional cases of blindness. Uh, so in this case, um, the counterfactual impact is quite positive. And I want to reiterate again that um, this is kind of a, this, is, this, can, this can feel like a tough choice, right? Because in the ideal world, we would be able to give everybody cataract surgeries and do everything else and then still have funding left over to um, train these guide dogs. Um, but in the world that we live in, these resources are limited. Many people, um, if we did not do this intervention, many people would not in fact receive these cataract surgeries and they would remain visually impaired. So how do we apply this lesson to comparing water sanitation and vaccination? Well, both water sanitation and vaccination are interventions that um, reduce the amount of um, time people spend being sick and potentially um, reduce the chance that somebody dies of those sicknesses. So they both um, have an effect on death and disability. So in order to know which of these two interventions is more cost effective, we have to know which one had a greater reduction of death or disability or whatever other metric we can use um, for the cost. Um, this graph is a graph of the cost per DALI averted of various interventions. A DALI is, stands for Disability Adjusted Life Year. Um, and what that is, it's a composite number that puts together um, the deaths averted, um, so how how, um, how much did you prolong somebody's life? Um, did you save lives? Um, if you saved the life of an older person, right, that would be fewer. Um, you would have prolonged their life for a short amount of time. And also disability averted. So if you averted a case of blindness, um, and if the person spent six years, uh, you know, without being blind, whereas they otherwise might have been blind for those six years, then you've averted six years of disability. So they put these numbers together and make into a composite number call, called the DALI. And this um, DALI unit can be used to compare many different interventions, each of which have their own kind of um, impact on various metrics of health and uh, life expectancy. So I think it's worth pointing out that none of these are frivolous interventions. They're all very important. Um, even if you look down at the bottom of the cost effectiveness chart, you know, things like C-sections, uh, cholera, I have uh, relatives who have suffered from cholera. These are all things that we really need. Um, but if you look at kind of the 
relative cost effectiveness of the various interventions, you can see that while some of them cost $6,000 for a year of life and health, which is in ordinary circumstances totally worth it, um, some of them um, can buy a year of life and health for under $100. And these highly cost-effective interventions are not always fully implemented, they're not always fully funded, and they often need more resources. Even if you zoom in on these extremely cost-effective range of interventions on this upper range, you'll find incredible variation. This is a zoomed-in picture. Um, and you can see that even here, whereas the um, least cost-effective ones are in the $600 range, there are interventions that can um, avert a DALI for, you know, potentially under $50. So from a point of view of taking care of our global society, um, I do think that it's important to make sure that these highly cost-effective interventions are fully funded and to make sure that they get the resources that they need before kind of moving on down to um, the other interventions. So, uh, so when we kind of uh, look for what to fund as effective altruists, we search for opportunities in this kind of highly cost-effective range that are, under, that are underfunded, and we seek to allocate resources to that. Now, I want to make a note that these numbers on this graph are not to be taken literally. This is just one analysis, and this can actually get quite complicated. Um, and let me say, let me explain why. Um, so imagine that you have uh, two interventions, and one is a vaccination in Uganda, and one is a vaccination in Kenya. They're both vaccination um, interventions. Which one is better? Um, and here you run into kind of the issue that even within the same intervention, um, small differences in the implementation uh, of the same intervention can have a really different uh, cost effectiveness. So you could have two identical, almost identical interventions with slightly different um, implementation techniques uh, running in slightly different locations and see completely different results. And it's hard to kind of know ahead of time uh, what the cost effectiveness of the intervention is going to be until you kind of run a study or a randomized control trial. So this means that you can't simply assume that an intervention is going to be cost effective just because it's sort of um, in kind of that upper range of some other study. And because you can't assume that, you need a systematic process to sort of um, find these top interventions. You can't really use guesses or heuristics. You can't say, oh, this sounds more cost effective because um, most uh, interventions are kind of in this long tail of less cost effective interventions. And there's only a few interventions that are um, in that like upper tier of cost effectiveness, uh, both in terms of the interventions themselves and in terms of the implementations of those interventions. You need a systematic process to find the most cost-effective interventions and the most cost-effective implementations of those interventions. Um, and to make matters even more confusing, cost-effectiveness isn't even the only consideration. Uh, so here we've got two hypothetical interventions. One is a surgery and one is a vaccination. And if you can find you know, volunteer doctors to do the surgery and keep the prices down, uh, these interventions might in this hypothetical example, be of similar cost effectiveness. But uh, they differ in terms of the qualifications required to do them. So for example, if there's many people who are qualified to submit a vaccination, to administer a vaccination, um, but there's only a few uh, people who are skilled enough to perform a surgery, that then becomes a new bottleneck. So even if you've got a highly cost effective surgery, um, if there's not enough people to administer that surgery, it doesn't necessarily help to pour more funding into the problem. Uh, if your limiting factor is um, some volunteer, uh, very skilled surgeons, uh, mo putting more money into the problem is not necessarily going to mean that more surgeries get done. And that means that there isn't um, room for more funding in that intervention. So for each of these interventions, uh, so for each intervention, not only is the cost effectiveness unpredictable, not only is the implementation unpredictable, but the uh, nature of the bottleneck that is preventing progress can be something other than cost effectiveness. It can be, for example, it might be that you have a very cost effective intervention, but the 
solution isn't scalable because there might not be enough people that are in the demographic that can be helped. Um, it might be that there's a shortage of qualified staff. Um, it might be that you're in a space, uh, you're working in a space where there aren't enough scientific studies for you to have a good handle on which strategies work and which don't. Uh, or sometimes the bottlenecks can be to do with infrastructure. So for um, each intervention, all of these things have to be analyzed. So the fun part of evaluating bottlenecks is that once you've figured out what this limiting factor is, uh, you can then direct resources to address it. Uh, and this brings me back to the purpose of my talk, which is what does charity entrepreneurship do? So we are a research incubation and training program that creates new organizations. So whatever the bottleneck happens to be, whether it be um, getting human resources, talented people to uh, work on our problem, or whether it be funding, whether it be a question of advocacy, whether we need research or um, external evaluation, or if the limiting factor is somebody who's doing direct work, we try to um, identify these bottlenecks and create an organization that addresses them. So we have, uh, so highlighted here in red is some organizations that we've incubated. And as you can see, we've launched organizations that are on every part of the spectrum. So I want to talk now about two organizations that we have launched, and they are Fortify Health and Charity Science Health. And both of these organizations have been incubated by GiveWell. GiveWell is an external evaluator of nonprofits, and they are probably one of the most rigor rigorous evaluation evaluators um, in the EA community. Arguably, uh, they're one of the most rigorous evaluators globally. And uh, so what it means for GiveWell to give an incubation grant to an organization is that it means that they think that this idea is promising enough that they want to see it launch and spread so that they can later evaluate whether this idea is cost-effective enough to fund. So, um, so Fortify Health is an organization that fortifies um, atta, which is an Indian wheat flour. Um, atta is used to make chapatis and rotis. You might have eaten them at Indian restaurants. And uh, when atta is fortified with iron and folic acid, then the people who then consume um, that atta are fortified against um, anemia and neural tube defects. So these are both huge public health concerns in India. Uh, meanwhile, Charity Science Health is a vaccination reminder program. So when you first have a newborn baby at the clinic, uh, the baby immediately gets a series of vaccinations. However, it's important to then return the baby with the baby to the clinic a few months later to get the booster shots. And people often, through a lack of understanding or sometimes through simply forgetting, uh, don't realize that they need to bring their baby into the clinic. Um, so Charity Science Health sends people um, an SMS, a text message, to remind them to go get their vaccinations. And uh, of these two organizations, um, Fortify Health a few years later actually turned out to be evaluated as an extremely cost-effective charity. Um, it's now received a second incubation grant of a million dollars. And um, GiveWell says that it has a 25% chance of achieving GiveWell top charity status. So that means that GiveWell believes that this organization is one of the most cost-effective organizations that is evaluated and would want to fund more of it. Um, so this is something that um, is not yet determined, of course, so we'll f find out over the next few years whether that 25% pans out. But um, this kind of represents a really great success story for our organization. Um, and so the reason for this um, is if you go back to that, um, that chart of different cost-effective interventions um, and saw which ones were the most cost-effective, um, remember how the most cost-effective interventions were somewhere between five or ten times as cost-effective as, you know, the next best one? Um, so this is also true for organizations that we fund. So here is um, a table of the estimated cost-effectiveness, according to GiveWell, of the different GiveWell top charities that are currently in operation. So uh, you can kind of take a look at these organizations. Um, uh, so here, give directly is considered baseline. So this is a common practice among um, organizations that cash can be considered sort of the giving people cash directly can be considered kind of the gold standard of every intervention should be at least as good as that. So um, 
if you take GIF directly as the baseline, you can see that these, these interventions are considered to be uh, more cost-effective than cash. Um, so some of them are 14 times more cost-effective, some of them are 29 times more cost-effective. They each have different kind of estimates as to how cost-effective they might be. And these cost-effectiveness numbers are then used to make funding allocation decisions. So uh, we would naturally uh, kind of first fund the kind of most cost-effective uh, organizations on this table. And then once they run out of room for more funding, which means once they can no longer uh, effectively use um, an additional dollar, we will then fund the next most cost-effective organization and, you know, kind of going on um, in that pattern. So this means that if you uh, create an organization which kind of competes with these really effective, really good organizations, um, you can really increase kind of the efficiency of the overall funding pool. Um, so if you can spend the funding that you are receiving maybe twice as cost effectively as where it would have otherwise have gone, or maybe even more than twice, um, that means that you can really kind of multiply um, the effectiveness of anything that you receive. So if you kind of uh, think about the scales involved here, um, some of these organizations are moving, you know, uh, between a million and $30 million. So when you consider if you can kind of get a grant of a million dollars or more and then use that grant twice or more as effectively as the organization that would have otherwise gotten it, um, that means that you are having the same impact as somebody who's donating that amount of money. Uh, that's, you know, more than any of us can kind of earn and, earn and then donate or more than any of us can sort of uh, do on our own ordinarily. So this really illustrates kind of the potential um, benefits of kind of being able to start a new organization that can compete and be cost effective on the scale. And the fact that kind of an external give well evaluation has uh, determined that Fortify Health um, ought to receive this kind of million dollar grant, um, it tells us that our methodology for kind of trying to determine that this intervention is cost effective. Our methodology that we use to determine that we ought to start Fortify Health as an organization, it tells us that that methodology worked. So I want to talk a bit now about how were these outcomes accomplished? How is charity entrepreneurship um, conceiving of and implementing um, organizations that go on to become externally recognized and become high impact organizations? Uh, the first step in this process is research. So like I mentioned before, uh, most interventions are not extremely cost effective and most implementations are within those cost effective interventions may not work equally well. Some of these implementations don't work. So you need a systematic research process to identify the most cost effective um, interventions and implementations. Uh, the first step in doing this is to have a focus on metrics. So in order to compare between two dissimilar interventions, you need some kind of metric to, um, to put them side by side um, in kind of the same units. So we talked before about the disability just life here, the DALI, uh, which was used to kind of compare different kinds of interventions that dealt with the problem of mortality and morbidity disease. Um, so in other areas, you might use different kind of metrics. So the four areas on the screen right now are the four areas that we happen to focus on um, in this previous year. And so let me talk a little bit about how we build metrics for these things. Um, for mental health and happiness, um, one way to measure is a subjective well-being. So you could ask people to rate their happiness from one to 10, and you could ask, you could figure out which interventions improve people's happiness ratings. Um, if somebody goes from a six to a seven after they get intervention A, or as they go from a six to an eight for intervention B, then you know that intervention B is more you know, effective at increasing their well-being. And then you can compare that to how much the intervention costs. So you can use this sort of framework to say, for example, um, would you rather give somebody therapy or medication, right? Which one is the most cost-effective way to increase um, mental health and happiness? For animal welfare, uh, we created a metric called the welfare point, which looks at um, kind of uh, metrics that apply across animals, such as mortality or hunger or thirst or injury. Um, so you could use something like a welfare point to say, is it better to have uh, cage-free eggs? Is it better to have a corporate campaign for cage-free eggs? Or is it better to have kind of a 
fortified feed, so like feed supplemented with, um, say, vitamin D or something to prevent kind of bone injuries in chickens. Um, we talked a lot about health and development policy earlier. Um, so disability is averted, deaths averted, income increased. These are all kinds of uh, useful things in the global health world. Uh, of course, when you're looking at policy, you additionally have sort of uh, considerations for um, how useful, how likely is it that your advocacy will be successful. Um, and for family planning. So you might, for example, say, how many unplanned pregnancies did you avert? So you could use that to kind of compare. Would you rather have education about um, family planning methods or would you rather have postpartum care in which you offer family planning um, services to women right after they've had a child? Um, so for kinds of different um, sorts of goals and different objectives and different cause areas, you can come up with different metrics that will help you quantify um, and compare interventions within those areas. And your choice of metrics will dramatically shift um, which interventions seem like they're more important or more cost-effective. So for example, if you focus on DALIs, you might um, you know, settle down on vaccinations as kind of the most effective intervention. Uh, whereas if you focus on something like subjective well-being or happiness as the most important thing, then your um, the interventions that you focus on might look very different. Although sometimes there's convergence. So for example, um, you know, sometimes a uh, intervention might uh, prevent disability or improve kind of health in a way that also increases mental health and happiness. So there's kinds of different metrics, different metrics kinds, kind of um, point to different things. Um, and sometimes there's convergence and sometimes there isn't. So when you're building metrics, you kind of have to decide um, how to compare between even these metrics. So how do you compare between death versus disability averting? How do you compare between disability um, in terms of physical disability versus um, mental impairments? These are all questions that each individual has to kind of grapple with. So having settled on metrics, it's time to compare actual interventions. So um, here we brainstorm a very large number of interventions, and then we systematically go through them. So we start out with uh, 1,200 ideas. Um, basically, we ask everybody we know, um, what do you think of? What's your, what, what kind of interventions do you think we should do? We ask all our staff to think of interventions. Um, and this way we get like a huge um, variety of possible interventions. Um, and then we spend some time narrowing them down. Uh, so of course, when you're just brainstorming many ideas, most of them aren't going to be any good. Um, but if you spend, you know, uh, 20 minutes looking at each idea, kind of examining it a little bit, you can sort of like eliminate the, the worst kind of ideas and get like ideas that are likely to be worthy of more consideration. Um, then we narrow down further um, and further until we kind of have a set of top ideas that we are planning on um, recommending for next year. And we take these top ideas and we generate um, an implementation report. So um, even if this intervention is cost effective, um, how do we kind of, um, what is the best way to implement it to, to um, ensure that it's actually going to have an impact? And in this process of narrowing down, we use some tools, um, some evaluation tools. So those tools are cost effective analysis. So that's essentially when you do a back of the envelope calculation of how many lives per dollar will something save? How many mental health kind of subjective well-being points will something increase per dollar? Um, you kind of try to do these quick estimates. Um, and of course, these estimates uh, being done kind of quickly won't necessarily be accurate. But um, even a back of the envelope calculation can help you sort of eliminate possibilities. We did this earlier with um, comparing um, the guide dog example, um, guide dogs for the blind with cataract surgeries for the blind. Um, in that situation, even a quick back of the envelope calculation can tell you that one of these two is going to be more cost effective than the other. Um, another method that we use is expert views. So sometimes there are experts in the field who know more than you ever could. And if you just go and ask them, hey, what do you think about this intervention? Um, they will kind of tell you this wealth of information that you hadn't even considered before. Um, so for each idea that's under consideration, we evaluate multiple experts in that field and kind of aggregate what their views are to kind of get a sense of what sort of the consensus view is in that field uh, and to determine which views are consensus views and which views are there kind of controversy on, right? Because experts um, know a lot about their particular kind of subfield, but they don't necessarily have like a broad eye overview of the field as a whole. So you kind of have to take the opinions of multiple experts and kind of put them together to get a sense of what's going on. 
Another tool we use is the weighted factor model. Um, so I discussed this a little bit earlier, where sometimes the bottleneck is funding, sometimes the bottleneck is the evidence base, um, sometimes the bottleneck is cost effectiveness, and that's not the only bottleneck. Um, sometimes the limiting factor can be simply just maybe it's maybe there's a law in a country that you want to work in, and it's kind of preventing you from working. So uh, what we do is we do a weighted factor model that will um, catch kind of each of these various factors and identify which factors are the ones which are, you know, maybe make or break the intervention. And finally, there's informed consideration. So this is kind of for those more open-ended narrative sorts of um, considerations that don't necessarily fit into these kinds of tables and numbers and values. So for example, you might find out that in a certain country, there's a policy window where there's a lot of political will to start a specific kind of intervention. Or you might find out that in this other country, um, there's kind of a new bill that's been passed that prevents you from working there. So these are the sorts of considerations that um, might not necessarily be suited for kind of these uh, the systematic table thinking, but nevertheless do have, um, do have a lot of uh, bearing, bearing on whether it would be possible to um, do that intervention. Uh, so finally, we have the implementation bottlenecks. Um, so this is the um, implementation bottleneck analysis for um, Charity Sands Health. So that is a reminder, that is the um, organization that sends uh, text message reminders to people reminding them to get vaccinated. Um, so there's many factors that go into determining whether an intervention like that can work. Um, so one of them is the pre-existing vaccination coverage. Um, if there are a lot of, if there's not, if there's a vac if there's a coverage gap, that that means it's a more promising place to work. Um, another one is mobile present penetration. Do they have a phone? Um, if some, if there's a population that does not really have a lot of cell phones, then you cannot expect a text message reminder system to work. Uh, and then there's literacy. So even if somebody um, can get has a phone and can get the reminder, if they can't read a detailed message about what they need to do then they're not going to be able to use their reminder to get a vaccine. Um, then there's the number of births. So these vaccines are all um, vaccines that you get shortly after a new baby is born in the first few months of life. So the number of births determines how many beneficiaries are there to receive the vaccines. Um, then there's the number of births in the clinic. So this is a proxy metric for whether there is a clinic. Um, if somebody gets a reminder to get a vaccination, uh, but there's no clinic to get vaccinated in, then the reminder doesn't really help them. Uh, we also looked at the coverage of neighboring nonprofits. So is there a neighboring nonprofit which is kind of taking care of vaccination in this area that using a similar method? Um, if so, it might be better to um, focus in areas that they're not covering. Um, and finally, language. So um, if there's a lot of kind of diversity of language, if people are speaking if most people speak a single language, if most people speak Hindi, for example, then you can send out a text message reminder in Hindi and everything's fine. But if people are speaking many different languages, then there's this kind of higher risk that you might kind of send the um, reminder out in the wrong long, you might send the reminder out in the wrong language. There might be kind of a general barriers to uh, the intervention working, language barriers. So taking all of these kinds of uh, implementation factors into account, you can then decide Things like, which specific state do I want to work in? Um, which specific location do I want to work in? You can choose um, the location, the intervention type. You can choose things such that everything works out in your favor. Um, and this prevents you from being in the situation where you had a great intervention, but your implementation didn't work, right? Because um, when you've looked at all the various factors that are likely to make an implementation work, and you choose your intervention and location and logistical, like, uh, you know, little things that go into your intervention, if you choose all of that in the first place based on the factors that you know are the most likely for success, then your implementation is much more likely to be cost effective. So what happens after research? Um, you can't stop at research, of course, you have to go on the ground. So the next step is training. So basically, uh, we have an incubation program. So we solicit applications from around the world from people who are interested in starting charities. And we bring them in and we uh, train them on how to do things like manage or hire people or uh, do a budget, how to run an organization. And we also train them on uh, many of the things that we cover today. So we train them how to do a cost-effective analysis, how to do a factor analysis of which um, 
bottlenecks will be in implementation. Um, we kind of show them all of the techniques that we use to come up with interventions and try to transfer to them the same level of knowledge and skill. Um, and then we give them funding. So a little bit of seed funding to start off these organizations um, so that they can begin kind of trying the intervention. So uh, the co here's the cohort that received um, training in 2019, and you can kind of see my face right over here. Uh, so basically, I joined Charity Entrepreneurship by attending their incubation program, uh, where they train people to launch these nonprofits. Um, so all of these people in this photo are actually the cohort that came in and got trained with me. And most of the people in this room went on to start um, high-impact organizations that are still running today. Uh, you can also see uh, two of the speakers that you read behind my, my photo. I'm hiding them. There's uh, Joey and uh, Carolina. Uh, so they gave the other two talks that you guys heard today. Um, so they were there and they helped us and they trained us to um, run these organizations. So um, as you can see, this is a very close-knit group. Um, the program's a lot of fun. Uh, you can see everyone's kind of hugging each other. Um, because when you're kind of all together with this group of uh, passionate people who are all trying to make a difference, um, it's really motivating and you can really get a lot done. So as somebody who's attended this program, I highly recommend it. So once these organizations have gotten their seed funding and have started down the journey of becoming an independent nonprofit, it is time for them to launch. And what this means is that it's time for them to separate from charity entrepreneurship and become independent organizations pursuing their own missions um, and seeking um, independent, separate sources of funding um, and um, evaluation and validation. So um, these are the six organizations. They're all independent organizations now that launched from Charity Entrepreneurship's uh, incubation program in 2019. All of these programs were started by the people who you saw in that photo with me earlier, my cohort. Um, and they're all kind of pursuing their separate missions. So Happier Lives Institute is working on expanding um, effective altruism's kind of uh, understanding of the happiness and subjective well-being kind of space. Um, Savita is working on behavior change to improve vaccination rates. Um, Policy Entrepreneurship Network and Good Policies um, are both kind of working on uh, policy, of course, uh, in the field of um, regulating uh, tobacco, so bringing tobacco in line with the World Health Organization's recommendations. Um, Animal Advocacy Careers is focusing on addressing human resources gaps in the animal welfare space. Um, and Fish Welfare Initiative is looking to do inter interventions that improve the lives of fish. So, for example, improving water quality. Um, and these organizations have all been doing quite well. So uh, recently, um, Animal Advocacy Careers got a grant from Open Philanthropy that is one of the um, grant makers within the effective altruism community. Um, the Fish Welfare Initiative has gotten a grant as well. Um, and Savita has gotten uh, a D prize, which is D stands for distribution. So this is a prize that goes out to um, interventions that show a, um, that do a good job of distributing uh, proven interventions within global health, right? The idea is that the, um, the idea is that we have kind of interventions that work, but we need to make sure that they get out to the people. Um, next, I want to show you a video of the Charity Entrepreneurship Cohort in 2020. So these are all people who I was involved in kind of helping train, uh, and they are all going to be starting new organizations coming up in the next year. Um, they're all really great people, so let's meet them. Thousands of applicants applied for Charity Entrepreneurship's program this year. And we had to go through the careful selection of narrowing down these thousands of people to 19 that we thought were particularly promising when it came to founding an impactful organization. Let's meet them. Hello there, my name is Corina Valli and I'm currently based in Pune, India. Uh, my name is Jack Rafferty and I'm from Sydney, Australia. My name is Anna Christina Thorsheim and I'm from Oslo, Norway. Uh, my name is Mohsen, I'm from Cairo, Egypt. Hi, my name is Ken. This is now my third take. The first two didn't get past high. I'm from the UK in a place called Kent. And I'm from Des Moines, Iowa in the US. I currently live at the Effective Altruism Hotel here in Blackburn, UK. 
I spent the last 15 years working in the development field. I've been working as a doctor in London. I'm currently the chief economist at ID Insight, which is an international development research organization. I've been involved in animal advocacy for about 10 years now, as well as plant-based food promotion. I've uh, helped co-found a startup developing VR-based exposure therapy. At the moment, I'm working at Google, uh, heading up their social impact programs. And the main cause areas I'm interested in uh, are poverty reduction and mental health as one of the factors that are pulling people back while they're trying to escape poverty. So uh, that was our latest cohort. Uh, they're clearly all really cool and all really fun to work with. Um, and they're all starting really cool charities. So we've got one project to reduce the amount of lead that is found in paint. Um, we've got a project that is working on guided self-help to improve mental health. Uh, one which is working on mass media for um, education about family planning services. Um, and an organization which is working on uh, doing research in the animal space to determine which um, corporate campaigns are the most useful for animals. Um, and we also have an organization which is, um, which is going to be uh, researching the most cost-effective ways to reduce uh, climate change. Um, in addition to all these great organizations, we have um, ideas that have not yet been launched. So in the animal space, we've got um, shrimp welfare, which is uh, similar to fish welfare, but for water quality and things like that for shrimp. And feed fortification, which is the improvement of uh, the feed that chickens get. So that prevents them from breaking their bones when they are on the farm. Um, and on the human side, we also have alcohol regulation, which is similar to tobacco control and lead paint regulation in the terms of its uh, public health implications and postpartum family planning, which is uh, an intervention which kind of uh, gives access to people, uh, gives people access to family planning services after they've given birth. So we're all, of course, super excited about the organizations that have launched this year, as well as the organizations that we anticipate launching next year. And uh, in next year's incubation program, we'll have a whole other research round and there'll be a whole new fresh crop of ideas to start. So I want to talk a little bit now about what actually happens during this incubation program. One of the things is that there is a, a seed grant. So this is basically a grant so that once you start a new organization, it can get off the ground. Um, and then you'll be able to use that seed grant to pay yourself and any early staff that you hire. Uh, we also uh, handle the initial legal hurdles. So we have a relationship with an organization which, um, which is called Players Philanthropy Fund. It was originally designed to help athletes um, create foundations and give to charitable causes without having to register formally as a charity. And today we use it for um, we use it to allow new charities to sort of uh, have a payroll, um, be able to receive donations without having to legally formally register as an official um, nonprofit organization in a country. Um, and you also get access to our co-working space. Uh, so basically this year, of course, we had the pandemic, so we were all remote. But hopefully next year there will be an office that you can come in and you can work together with other people who are just as passionate as you are about making a difference, uh, similarly to how we did in 2019. Um, CE also... Um, helps you by building a powerful network. Um, so in that picture is uh, the philosopher Peter Singer. So some of you might recognize him. He's a big hero to a lot of uh, consequentialist uh, sort of utilitarian thinkers who tend to kind of align with effective altruism's uh, way of thinking. Um, but we'll also connect you to a lot of uh, people who, are, who might fund your organization, for example, donors. Um, we can also connect um, our incubatees to experts in the field that they're going to be working in. So part of our curriculum, for example, is contacting various experts who are knowledgeable about the areas that you're working in and kind of getting their input and building a relationship with them, as well as connections with kind of partner organizations, um, and basically anyone who can kind of help you to make your intervention happen. Um, and of course, we uh, offer mentorship and assistance. So when you come in, we can offer you classes. Uh, we will pay for kind of the flights, the tuition of, um, you know, you'll be able to kind of get free training at, at the program. Uh, the meals will be paid for. We'll cover housing. Um, and we're kind of going to give you ongoing um, mentorship. So even after you kind of leave the program, uh, you would be able to get... Um, 
regular sorts of check-ins and advice um, about how you can kind of uh, move the organization forward. Um, our curriculum covers everything that you could need to start a nonprofit. So everything from registering as a nonprofit to forming a board and all the way over to things like cost effective analysis and how to kind of measure the impact you're having. So we really try to cover the full spectrum of what a founder of a highly effective nonprofit would need. Uh, thanks to the pandemic this year, we also have a very well developed online program. So we've got a handbook, um, how to start a high impact nonprofit. Um, so you can access this handbook online. We also have uh, many video lectures. And during the program, we will have regular um, Zoom chats where you can kind of get to know other people who are in your cohort, even if you can't be there in person. So in some ways, this is a silver lining to come out of the pandemic that we have now created sort of this reusable infrastructure that can be kind of repeated from year to year. Uh, but of course, assuming the pandemic lets up, we will also have our in-person program where we will cover accommodations, foods, and flight so that you can, uh, you know, come and experience the program in person and hopefully uh, meet many useful mentors and maybe meet a co-founder so you can start an organization. So I want to close by saying that there's a lot of unsolved problems and there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's just kind of waiting for people who are ready to roll up their sleeves and do it. Um, I think often sometimes people are intimidated by saying, what can I do? Or um, how can I contribute to this effort where there's so many people already contributing? Uh, but the size of kind of the problem and the size of how many issues need to be resolved make it so that there's a lot of opportunity for each person to have a massive impact, whether that be uh, via doing direct work or via um, advocacy or via donations. Um, there are many opportunities for you to have an impact. Um, and so mostly what you have to decide is what to work on. Um, and I want to give some of my kind of broad takeaways from what I've learned at my time for charity entrepreneurship about how to pick what to work on. Um, so here's what I've learned. Um, I've said, I've learned, don't stop at a deep analysis of one idea. Um, instead, systematically compare multiple options. So I think a lot of times it's easy to kind of get stuck on this is the way to have an impact, right? Um, but if you kind of start comparing many options side by side, Having that sort of direct comparison will really help you to think more objectively about the options that you have. Um, another thing that I've learned is it's uh, more important to be specific, right? Many people will think that they're going to do science or advocacy, but uh, it's really important to get narrow down and get to these really specific actions and think about exactly how they're going to cause impact. Um, finally, um, I would recommend not being too tied to your pre-existing skill sets, your pre-existing work experience, your degree. Um, most people ultimately don't necessarily work on the same things that they started coming in to work on. They don't necessarily work on whatever they had experience with in the past. Um, I'd say that choose to work on, choose what to work on primarily based on what has the most impact. Uh, so kind of chase the impact, flexibly follow the impact. Um, don't be constricted too much by pre-existing degrees. They're important, but they're not everything. So uh, finally, if you liked what we heard today, uh, you can join us. So we will have an incubation program in 2021 and uh, applications will open in December. So if you're interested, you should sign up at uh, charityentrepreneurship.com and we can send you an email once applications open. And we really strongly encourage everybody who's interested to apply. You don't have to be any particular kind of person. You don't have to have a particular kind of experience. Um, our applicants range from just starting out to people in mid-career um, and even in late career. Um, and just to really make this point, I want to show you uh, this, these images of logos of organizations whose founders have less than four years of experience. So many of these organizations are you know, recognized. Some of them are leaders in their fields. Um, and they were all started by people who were explicitly trying to do the most good in an evidence-based way. And I think that the success of these organizations is really a testament to the power of the individuals and groups who want to do the most that they can for the world and are willing to systematically put in effort into finding out what that is and then executing the results of that research. So that's all for me. Uh, thank you for listening to my talk. I hope you came away with um, excitement and new ideas about how to help the world. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Bye.